And how about a hand for all the moms? You know, we often don't see ourselves the way that the, the people who love us see us. And we often, we really don't see ourselves the way that God sees us. And uh, this morning, we just wanted to begin by blessing all the moms uh, who are in the house here. Thank you, first of all, for all that you do, for all that you've done, and just for being you. And we're so glad uh, that we get to be a part of your journey. And so uh, we want to we wanna bless you with prayer. And um, if you wouldn't mind, if all the moms in the house could just stand up, we want to recognize you and want to pray for you. Can we give a hand to the moms as they stand up in the house this, this morning? Come on, give, give them a hand. Awesome. Thank you, thank you. The Bible says there is an impartation of, uh, of God's blessing as we uh, stretch forth our hands. So church, would you stretch forth your hands towards these moms uh, right around you? We just want to bless you with a prayer this morning. So Father, we thank you so much, first of all, for every mom that's in the house. God, uh, so many sacrifices that have gone unseen and probably will never be understood or appreciated. But God, you've seen all of it. You've seen every tear that was shed. You've seen every um, amount of sacrifice and pain uh, that these moms endured for their families. And so, God, we pray this morning that you would fill them with your spirit to overflowing. God, that you would encourage them this morning with whatever they may be walking through, even right now and the, the trials that they're still facing. God, I pray that you would fill them with your spirit knowing that they're not alone, that your spirit goes beside them and is inside of them to empower them to do what you've called them to do and be who you've called them to be. Moreover, that you see them as your precious children whom you love and you have great things in store for here on this earth and forever in eternity with you. So God bless each mom this morning. You love them. We love them. Let them feel your love and your presence. We pray this in the name of Jesus. And the church says together, amen and amen. How about another hand for the moms? Thank you so much. You may be seated. Oh, first service, I, I couldn't get through that prayer. I, I got emotional. And then the beginning of my message was all over the place as I was trying to regather myself. So let's see if I can do better this morning. Uh, it's great to see you guys. Pastor Norman is on a, a much-needed vacation uh, today, getting uh, some rest and studying. And uh, so you got me. My name's Billy. I'm one of the pastors here. So how's it going? Hang on tight. We'll get through this together. Amen. All right. But uh, I just want to say, moms, again, thank you from the bottom of my heart, our heart as a Pearlside staff you know, uh, my mom was a single mom uh, when I was growing up, and she took care of me, and I, I saw her work real hard and do what she needed to do to take care of me, and, I, and so I, I feel a lot of your pain, and I just want to say, you know, I didn't appreciate my mom when I was younger, um, but as I got older, I began to appreciate her more and more, and I just want to say, you know, in, in light, the video that we just watched, I never saw my mom as scattered in a hot mess. Uh, she was my mom who loved me, and uh, I know she felt that way, and let me talk about it a little bit, a little bit later, but... Um, I knew she loved me and she was there for me. And, and you know what? I just want to say thank you for what you do for your kids and your families, your husbands, because uh, we can be big babies sometimes. So uh, thank you for all that you do. Amen. Um, well, you know, as, as the video depicted, we often don't see ourselves the way that those that love us see us. Our children see us one way, and we certainly don't see ourselves the way that God sees us most of the time. And uh, we need to begin to see ourselves through God's eyes. And that's the title of this morning's message, Seeing Ourselves Through God's Eyes. And we're continuing our series, This Is Us, uh, by popular demand. We, want, we kept it going. And we're going to be talking about, we've been talking about what is our identity in Christ? Who are we uh, the, from God's perspective? And in your notes there and up on screen, it says, We often identify ourselves by our flaws and our shortcomings. Isn't that true? When we think about ourselves, we think about ourselves from what, usually based of what we're not. When we look at people that we wish we could be like and things that we wish we could do, and we're like, man, I'm not that. And often that becomes our identity. That can become our self-talk. This is what I am not. I'm not this. I'm not that. We often identify ourselves by our flaws and our shortcomings, but God identifies us as his children. And somebody should say a strong amen to that. God sees us as his kids. Look at what this passage says here in John, 1 John chapter 3. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. If you, have, if you have a pen, you might want to highlight, underline, circle that. We are children of God, and that is what we are. This is just one place of many places in Scripture where God goes out of his way, or the Bible goes out of his way to describe ourselves as children of God, that God is a loving Father, and that we are his children. Jesus even goes so far as to say that we, we can cry out to him, Abba, which is basically baby talk. It's like a baby saying, Dada or Daddy. 
And to the ancient Jews, that would, have, that would have sounded like heresy. How dare you call Yahweh, the great God, Dada. We don't call him that. He is Yahweh. We can't even really speak his name because that's how holy he is. And Jesus says, listen, I know him a little bit better than you do. And he is Daddy. He is Dada to you. God is our father. We are his children. Don't view, be, we got to be careful not to view ourselves through the lens of our past, through the lens of our shortcomings, through the lens of our failures, but rather view ourselves the way that God sees us and the way that he describes us in his word as his loving children. You know, I remember when I found out that, uh, when we found out that my wife Naomi was pregnant, she was ready to have babies a lot before, before I did. And so when I finally came around to the idea, I was like, all right, let's do this. We'll have babies with a little bit of uh, anxiety. Any, any fathers know what I'm talking about? A lot, actually, a lot of anxiety. Uh, not like I was going to give birth or anything, but I still had anxiety over it. Um, but when we found out that she was pregnant with our, with our, our son, our firstborn, I, I was just so excited. I was just so overwhelmed with this weird sense of joy that I never had before. And I learned later that's unconditional love. That's what that feels like. And, uh, you know, then we go on the Internet, right, and began to discover that there's websites that tell you what the baby is doing right now while he's in the womb. It's pretty amazing, right, that at one week the baby is doing this, and at two weeks he's doing this, three weeks, six weeks, whatever. And I remember one day Naomi told me, she said, you know what the baby's right now? He's a tadpole. And I was like, oh, I have a tadpole. I got so excited over this little tadpole that, that I had. I was like, man, I, I want to meet him, you know. I mean, stay in there, keep, keep growing. But, but I, I have a tadpole. And I remember I was just so excited about that. And then I found out, oh, no, now he's, a, he's the size of a blueberry. And I was like, oh, my God, I have a blueberry. I, re I remember I told some of my friends, my baby's a blueberry. Oh, my God, I have a blue. And I was just so excited at every stage of his development and growth. I was just so overjoyed because that was my child. I'd never met him yet, never seen him yet. He hadn't done anything for me. But that was my child, and I loved him at every single stage. And when I remember when he was first born and the doctors placed him in my hands, I was like, oh, my goodness, this is my, this is my child. And, you know, at that moment, he was immediately a member of my family and immediately an heir to everything that, that I have, right? If I were to die, he gets, you know, he gets everything, you know, and not a whole lot, you know. Maybe he could pay, like, one semester of college with that. But nonetheless, you are my heir based not on anything that he had done to deserve it, based on nothing that he had done to earn it, or earn it or prove that he deserves to be a part of my family, he was my child. And he, in, in that he just simply was. And I think the Bible's trying to tell us something, that you are his child. It's not something that you earn. It's not something that you deserve. It's not something that you work up. It's something that we receive as an identity by God's grace. See, religion tells us all the things that we need to do to deserve to become a child of God, right? You got to do this right. You got to do that right. You got to do these sacrifices, whatever. These works to earn your position or your status as God's child. But the gospel teaches us exactly the opposite. You are God's child, period, by faith. When you trust in Jesus, you are God's child. And everything that we do after that is an outflow of who we already are. When we, when we love and we're serving and when all these kinds of things, it's an overflow of our identity as a child of God by faith. And we need to remember that, that that's the foundation of who we are. And that's why the Bible over and over and over again wants to remind us you are a child of God. You are a child of God. He is your father. You call him daddy because that's who he is. And some of us here this morning may feel like, you know, I don't deserve to be called a child of God. I'm a hot mess, right? I don't deserve to be called a child of God because of my past, as we'll see in just a moment, or because of what I'm walking through right now or the things that I've done. But the Bible says quite the opposite. When you place your trust in Jesus, that's why he died on the cross for our sins and rose from the dead. When we place our trust in Jesus, he gives us a new identity as his child. How many think that's a good thing this morning? But we need to see ourselves that way. And if we don't see ourselves that way, chances are we're going to live very differently. If we see it as I got to earn it, I got to des deserve it, or I'm not good enough, and I can never earn it or deserve it, we're going to live very differently. And it's very possible that we can look at something and not see it for what it really is. Isn't that true? A couple of years ago, uh, a picture went viral on the Internet. Maybe some of you remember it. I'm sure you've seen it. It's, somebody posted a picture of a wedding dress or a dress that they were wearing to a wedding. And it went viral because no one could agree about what color the dress was. How many of you remember the dress? How many of you argued with your coworkers about the dress, all right? Uh, take it, throw, throw that picture real quick. Uh, I promise there's a spiritual point somewhere. You guys remember this? So what happened was somebody posted this dress, and people were, were going, oh, you know, they were, began arguing. Husbands and wives started fighting. You know, cats and dogs started fighting with each other. What color is the dress? Because some people saw the dress as blue and black, and some people saw the dress as gold and white. Now, we did this in the earlier service, and we asked this question, how many of you see the dress as gold and white? Hands up. All right, all right. There's a few of you. All right. 
Okay. How many of you see the dress as blue and black? Okay. Now, discuss amongst yourselves who's right. <laughs> It's possible that the same people were looking at the exact same picture and seeing something completely different. So, so, so what happened here, scientists started getting involved. They're saying it, it all has to do with the way that our eyes and our brains perceive color and light and this whole thing. But they're looking at the same picture but seeing something completely different. And then a couple of months later, about a year later, another picture went viral. And it's, it's this one right here of a shoe. And people were arguing what color the shoe was. Anybody seen this one? Some people see the shoe as gray and green-ish, gray, gray and teal. Some people see it as pink and white. Okay. <laughs> Don't hurt each other. Okay, how many of you see gray and, gray and green? Gray and green, all right. Pink and white, people, pink and white. All right. Some of y'all need to go to the eye doctor after this is over. I'm just saying. <laughs> so it's possible that we can look at the exact same thing and see something totally different. Isn't that true? I mean, we're, we're seeing it right here in this moment. So what ended up happening was the, the maker of the dress, a company by the name of Roman Originals, found out how this thing went viral and said, okay, let, let me settle the score once and for all. And they posted this picture from their website that the dress is, in fact, blue and black. So all of you white and gold people, figure it out. I don't know. Okay? <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's, it's, it's nothing, nothing, nothing bad that I can tell, okay? And then someone went on the Vans website and discovered that there is no gray and green Vans shoe. It's in fact, it's in fact pink and white. That's all they got. So two different people can be looking at the same thing, see something totally different, have a totally different opinion about what something is and give something an identity that, that, that we can ascribe to it. But what it took was... The maker of the dress had to definitively say, no, 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 it's blue and black. Trust me, I made the dress. I kind of know what color it is, right? The maker of the shoes had to tell us what color the shoes was. It's pink and white. It's not gray and teal. I don't make gray and teal. It's pink and white. And sometimes when we look at ourselves and when we let other people define us, we can come out with some, um, some strange conclusions. What we need is for the maker to tell us, let me tell you who you are. Let me tell you what kind of stuff you're made of. Let me tell you what I see in you. I don't see gold and white. Those people are just wrong. It's blue and black. I don't see a hot mess. I see a child of God. I don't see a failure. I see a child of God. And we need to remind ourselves what the Bible says about us because life will tell us something else. Oh, you're grand teal. It's pretty ugly, by the way. It's grand teal. Who would wear that, you know? No, no, no. You're pink and white. Baby, my daughter loves pink. You know what I'm saying? You're pink and white. That is who you are. And we have to be careful not to let the world define us or let life define us or let other people define us. We have to be careful that we don't define us ourselves differently than what God's word says. We need to go back to the maker, amen? We need to go back to what he says about us because he knows who we are and he knows what we made. Are you guys following me so far this morning? What does the Bible say? He says, you are my child. I am your father. Call me Abba. Call me daddy because that is who I am. We need to remind ourselves what God says about us because life will tell us something very different. Our circumstances can tell us something very different. There's a powerful story in the Bible that I think illustrates this. I mean, there's a ton of them, uh, but, but here's one in particular. It's a story of a mom, and her name was Rahab. And Rahab, if you, when we first see her in the New Testament, we find her in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. She turns up as the great-grandmother of King David, this woman named Rahab, and then the 35th great-grandmother of Jesus Christ. This woman named Rahab. And we find out later on, if you're just reading through the New Testament in the book of Hebrews and James, describes her as Rahab the prostitute. Okay, no, wait, hold on, back up now. It's Mother's Day, Pastor, why are you talking about a prostitute? When you go to your brunches, hey, what'd you learn at church today? Oh, we talked about a prostitute. Yeah, that'd be fun. Um, we find out that this woman named Rahab was a prostitute, but she ends up in the genealogy of Jesus as the great 35th great-grandmother of Jesus and second great-grandmother of King David. What's her story? I mean, why would God allow this, this woman of ill repute or whatever to be in his word, to be, the, you know, uh, uh, in the lineage of the Messiah? Her story begins in jo uh, Joshua chapter 2, and we find her story, and her story relates to moms, relates to dads, relates, relates to all of us in between, because this is a story about us. Um, Rahab first shows up. In, jo in Joshua chapter 2, the Israelites are about to cross over into the promised land to take possession of it. It was their promised land. And one of the cities that they had to conquer was a city called Jericho. It was a Canaanite stronghold uh, that they couldn't move any further if they didn't conquer uh, Jericho. 
the Canaanites were pagan people, practiced human sacrifice, child sacrifice. It was a bad deal. And so God was using Israel to bring his judgment on, on these people for their sins. And so before the army was to enter in, Joshua sent in two spies to spy out Jericho and see what's going on. And they hid in the home of Rahab, the prostitute. And we pick up the story here in Joshua chapter 2. What would Rahab do? Knowing that the Israelites are coming to attack her city, would she turn them in? She probably could have and should have. Would she have them killed? What would she do? And we find out here in Joshua chapter 2, starting in verse 8, what she did. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, the spies, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea or when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sihon and Og, the kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God. Look at her confession here. The Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. The Lord your God is God. He's not just another tribal God. He's not just another one of the, you know, the little deities that, you know, the different tribes have. He is the creator of heaven and earth. He is the Lord of all creation. Based on what she heard about Israel over the years, about God and what he did, she began to have faith. And in this moment when the spies came to her, she chose to place her faith in God rather than place her faith in anything else. She chose to place her faith in God, the high God, the creator God, the God of the Israelites, rather than anything else. And we'll find out later that's what eventually led to her deliverance and her salvation. A couple of things that we learned from this story, first of all, is that our identity is not based on our past. Our identity is not based on our past. I mean, think about Rahab. She, of anyone, probably could have felt, you know what, what's the point of even calling out to the God of the Israelites? I mean, there's no way he's going to accept me. There's no way that he would deliver me. I mean, I'm a prostitute. All the things that I did in my past, all the things that I've experienced, there is no way that their God is going to accept me because he's a holy God. He's a righteous God. There's no way he would possibly want to deliver me a prostitute after all that I've been through. The story goes on. She hides the spies. And when Israel comes in and attacks the city of Jericho, they protect Rahab bring, and bring her family out and, and essentially save her. She later on goes on to marry one of the Israelites, a man named Salmon, and goes on to become the great-grandmother of King David and later on to Jesus Christ. She gets brought out of her situation and brought into a new family. Not because of anything that she had done, but because of her faith. And if anyone could have said, I don't deserve a new life. I don't deserve a new beginning. I don't deserve a new identity. It probably should have been her. Amen? Because of her past. But she didn't identify herself based on her past. She chose faith. And it was faith that brought her salvation and deliverance. And I think this is good news for all of us, isn't it? Because all of us have a past. Isn't that true? All of us have things in our past that either we've done or things that were done to us that if we're not careful can become our identity. That's who I am. I'm a failure. I'm a mess up. I'm a this. I'm a that. People have told me I, I shouldn't be here. I don't belong. You were never meant to be born. I mean, I don't know what things you've gone through in your past. But I want to tell you something. God doesn't define us by our past. He defines us by our faith. Amen. He, he, our past doesn't have to be a determiner of our future. It's like this. How many of you, when you're driving in your car, you, you stare at the rearview mirror while you're going forward? No, you don't, right? That would be pretty dangerous if you're just constantly staring in the rear view as you're trying to, trying to go forward. If you do that, by the way, stop, okay? <laughs> or, or go drive on someplace else because that's very dangerous. No, you glance at the rear view to see where you've gone or to see what's behind you, but you, you, your, your eyes are fixed forward. Isn't that true? And I think that's a metaphor of, of our lives. Some of us, unfortunately, live our lives just staring at the past. What's happened to me? What's been done to me? All the things that I've been through, all of my failures, and that's just who I am. Never mind what's in front of me. I'm just thinking about how I've messed up in the past and what's been done to me. Rahab could have easily done that. She could have easily said, man, look at all this. My past, there's no way that the God of the Bible would possibly accept me. But she, trust, she chose faith instead, and she ended up getting a whole new story rewritten for her. See, there's this mentality in our world that I need to be good enough to earn God's approval. I need to, be, I need to earn my position as his child. And if I've, because of my past, some, some people feel like they, they can never do that. I still have this friend to this day who says, you know, I can't come to church because, you know, the church is going to burn down if I come. You know what I'm saying? People kind of have that mentality. And when we were at Momilani School back in the day in LCC, I said, no worries, it's not our building. You know what I'm saying? I'm pretty sure the state has insurance. It'll be all good. 
you know. And I just invited him last Easter, and he said the same thing to me. I said, don't worry, we have sprinklers, okay. <laughs> It'll be fine. But, but, but moreover, I thought about it after I talked to him. I said, you know, it doesn't make any sense that God would burn down his church because you walked in, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's more realistic that like, you catch on fire. But that's not going to happen either, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's not going to happen. Neither will happen, okay, because that's not, that's not the God of the Bible, okay. Because he sees you as his child. And as we talked about last week with the prodigal son, you're his child, but maybe you're estranged from God, right? When the prodigal son ran away, you're still his child, but you need to come home. And even the son that was home, he, needed, he didn't have a real relationship with the father. He was only about his own inheritance, right? But it doesn't make you any less his child. So come home. Come home. Get reconnected with God. And some of you are here this, this morning, and maybe that's your story. You felt like, man, I can't go to God because of my past. There's no way he'd want to have a relationship with me. And so we've kept God kind of at a distance. Or maybe you tried that church thing before, and it didn't go so well, and then you made some bad decisions after that. And like, nah, there's no way he would want me back after that and that situation. And listen, I think the Bible tells us over and over and over again, and in this story of this woman named Rahab, that God is not a respecter of our past. He's a respecter of our faith. When he looks at us, he's not looking at all the, all the, you know, the good or the bad that we did in our past, by the way. When we knock on heaven's door one day, he's not going to say, show me your resume of all the good things that you did, right? Or show me the, the, the hope that you, hopefully there's a very short list of the bad things that you did. Oh, therefore, you can come into heaven. It doesn't work that way. God's going to look at, what, what have you done with Jesus? The one who paid the price for your sins on the cross. The one who lived the life that you should have lived and died the death that you should have died. What did you do with his blood that was spilled for you? And if we say, and if, if it's our faith is in Jesus, that's what gets us in the heaven. It's not what we could do. It's about based on what he did, right? God, is not, God doesn't define us by our past, but he defines us by our present faith. Where is your faith at this morning? Are you presently trusting in Jesus Christ for your salvation? Rahab looked at God. She heard the stories about him. And she said, I'm going to place my trust in him for deliverance. I know the Israelites are going to destroy Jericho, man. They destroyed everything else. I need to trust in him to deliver me. And that's what she did, and that's what happened. She was delivered, her and her whole household. Don't let your past define you. Can I hear an amen to that? But let, let it be about your faith, trusting in God. And when we trust in God, he re rewrites a new story, a new story of our lives, just as he rewrote Rahab's story. The second thing that we see here is that our identity is not based on our present circumstances. It's not based on our past, but it's also not based on our present circumstances. I mean, think about Rahab's present circumstances. Theologians and historians have postulated that the reason why Rahab went into prostitution, it was likely because her husband had died. Do they know this because, number one, she had a family to take care of. And when she talked to the spies, she said, promise that you'll deliver me and my family from Jericho when it's destroyed. She's, she's worried about taking care of her family. She wouldn't have had to take care of her family if she had a husband to take care of her family. What likely happened is her husband died, and in the ancient world, there weren't a whole lot of jobs that women could get. So in order to take care of their family, and there were no social services, by the way. So in order to take care of their family, she did what, what was the only job that she could do, which was turn her life to prostitution, to survive and to take care of her family. And so she could have said, man, my husband's dead. We're living in poverty. I had to sell my body in order to take care of my family. Look at, look at, look at my circumstances. There's no way God loves me. There is no way that he could want anything to do with me. Look at, look at my life. I mean, he, those people over there, yeah, surely God loves them because look at what they've got. And look at how they're doing. And look at how, how they're successful and they're blessed. But look at me and my circumstances. There's no way God could possibly love me. She could have easily identified herself based off of her circumstances. But instead of doing that and keeping God at a distance, she decided to place her faith in God. Very often what can tend to happen, I've seen it in my life and in many others, is when things don't go the way that we think that they ought to go, yeah, when our circumstances don't plan out the way that we want, we tend to want to keep God at a distance. Isn't that true? Well, if you're not going to take care of me, if you're not going to, you know, prove to me that you love me, then I'm just going to stay away from you. Can I encourage you this morning? Don't do that. Because God, again, is a father and he wants us to draw near to him. And our present circumstances don't dictate who we are to him. Just because maybe you're not as rich as the person next door or as blessed as the person across the street, whatever it is, it doesn't mean you're any less valuable to God. And Rahab didn't let her present circumstances stop her. Instead, she chose to draw close and to trust him. And God delivered her and brought her out and rewrote her story. Don't let your present circumstances dictate the way that you believe that God feels about you or loves you. Because, again, we got to let his word define us, not our circumstances, not what we possess. You know, a recent survey was done on how much money it would take, a nationwide survey was done, asking people how much money they thought it would take to live the American dream. 
So they surveyed, you know, a nationwide survey. And of people who made an average of $45,000, they said, if I made around $90,000, I'd feel like I could live the American dream. So about twice as much. Uh, clearly, these people don't live in Hawaii, but anyway. Um, of the people who made around $120,000, they asked them, how much money do you think it would take to live the American dream? And the average of their responses came back, if I made around $200,000, then I think I would be able to live the American dream. Notice that no one who made $120,000 said, I'm already living the American dream. I'm good. It's, it's always more. And in every category that was surveyed, satisfaction was never, people were never satisfied. It always, they always said, wherever they were at in their status of life, I need about twice as much of, of what I have right now in order to be content and to be happy. And the Brookings Institute came back and said, you know, it, it seems like this American dream is elusive. This happiness and this satisfaction that we all desire is elusive to us because no matter how much we have, we always feel like we need more. And I, and I take that and I apply that to this in that if, we, if we're looking at stuff and possessions and money to give us our identity, it's elusive. It's like running on a hamster wheel. We're never going to get there. Every step we take forward, we realize there's another step I need to take and another step. And, and we're never going to be satisfied if we're getting our identity based off of our present circumstances. Or if I just have a newer car. Well, yeah, that new car gets old after a little while, and you want a newer car. Isn't that true? If I just had a bigger house, and you get a bigger house, and you're like, man, that person across the street's house is bigger than mine. I need a bigger one now, right? And it's a constant rat race and a hamster wheel of an existence if we're getting our identity based off of our present circumstances. That's why the Bible goes back and it reminds us, no, 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 you're not your past. You're not your current circumstances. You're not what you possess, and you're not what other people think about you. You are what I say about you. And what I say is you are a child of God. You are my child. By faith. Can I hear an amen to that? I love this passage in Psalm 23. It says this, The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. And you've probably heard this before. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. And I love this, this verse 6, this last confession. Surely, or I am confident, that your goodness and your love will follow me all the days of my life. I am confident that your goodness and your love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever in heaven. Even though I'm walking through the darkest valley right now, even though right now I'm not experiencing the goodness that I read about in the Bible, even though I find myself in, in unfavorable circumstances, I am confident that as I walk with you, you're going to lead me out of this valley. The whole point of walking a sheep through a valley is because you're trying to get to another pasture, right? I'm taking you from one pasture that is gone, now through a deep valley so we can get to the other side where there's even greener pastures. But sometimes that walk through the valley takes kind of a while, isn't that true? And we're tempted to want to give up on God or want to run away from God because we feel like, you know, what am I doing in this valley? God, you don't love me like you love those other people, so I'm going to distance myself from you in the midst of the valley. But God is leading us somewhere. And our confidence needs to be, I know you're my father and I know I'm your child. And as we walk through this valley, I know you're taking me somewhere. And there's a greener pasture on the other side. Surely I am confident that goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and moreover in eternal life in heaven. Don't let your present circumstances define you. Don't give in to the temptation that while we're in the dark valley, while he's walking us through valleys, because all of us go through valleys, amen? While we're walking through the valley to, to, to say, God, you must not love me. I'm going to unhitch myself from you now. I'm going to separate myself from you now. Keep walking with him through the valley because he's leading us to a greener pasture. Can I hear an amen to that? And Rahab could have easily said, you know, because of my circumstances, my husband's dead. I had to sell myself had to do all of these horrible things, surely, God, you must not love me. I'm not even going to ask these Israelites to save me. I'm not even going to pray to God for deliverance. I'm so glad she didn't do that. I'm so glad she, she heard the stories about God and said, I'm going to place my trust in him because that's what led to her deliverance. And lastly, our identity doesn't come from our past. It doesn't come from our current circumstances. Our identity comes through faith. Our identity comes through faith. The book of Hebrews describes this woman, Rahab, by faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. Not because she deserved it, not because she cleaned up her act first, not because she earned it, simply by faith. Because she trusted in God, she was delivered. And I want to say to you this morning, you don't have to earn God's love and his approval. You just have to trust in him. 
You don't have to deserve it. You don't have to prove to him that you matter. You don't have to prove to him that, that, that why he should love you. You're his child. Trust in him. And as we trust in him, he begins to reveal more and more of himself to us by faith. I love what the Apostle James says, the half-brother of Jesus said, Was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. See, what's important about this passage is she heard the stories about God, about the God of the Israelites, but she actually had to place her trust in him. And faith always has a next step. Faith always has a next step. It's not just something that we have in our heads. Faith always has a step that we take. As James says here, faith without deeds is dead. Our faith has to be accompanied by deeds. And in that moment, she had a choice. Am I going to choose to help the spies and hide them and send the the, the people that were pursuing them away, or am I going to expose them? She chose the step of faith. Her next step was to hide the spies, and that's what she did. And that's what ended up leading to the deliverance of herself and her whole household. What is your next step this morning? All of us have a next step. Maybe your next step is to join a grace group. You hear us talk about that all the time, which is our sermon-based groups where we process the word together. And we're going to talk about Rahab and this whole story and how it relates to our lives this week in group. Maybe that's your next step. Maybe your next step is to get connected into our growth track where you learn about what it means to follow God, to know him, and to walk this thing out. We talk about stuff like repentance and and just all, all the things, what it means to be a Christ follower. Maybe your next step, if you're new today, is just come back next week and keep letting the word get, get spoken to you and let that let faith grow in your heart. But all of us have a next step. And I want to encourage you, don't be complacent in your walk with God. Rahab could have easily said, well, if God wanted to deliver me, he would deliver me, so we'll see what happens. No, no, no. She chose to take a step of faith. She said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to help you. I'm going to hide the spies. So God, deliver me. Promise you'll deliver me if I, if I take this step of faith. There's always a step of faith that needs to happen. That's what the Apostle James is saying here. You can have faith, but you don't have deeds of faith. That faith is dead. It's useless. What is your next step this morning? Because God wants us to continue to grow in our relationship with him. Amen? There's always a next step. What is your next step this morning? And then lastly here, I love this verse. Consequently, faith, where does this faith come from? Faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word about Christ. The more we hear the word, the more we get the word in us, the more faith in our heart grows. And our faith needs to grow because the world is saying all kinds of other things to us. You're not good enough. You need to earn it. You need to deserve it. Maybe you're hearing the voices of coaches from your past saying you're not good enough. You know, you're too small. You're too this, you know. Maybe voices of ex-relationships that spoke down to you. Maybe even parents. Whatever voices we're hearing constantly. Maybe it's your coworkers, your boss. We need to constantly let God's voice speak louder than those voices. Amen. Because otherwise we'll live differently. We'll bow down to the other voices and we'll see ourselves differently, not the way that God sees us. We need to see ourselves through his eyes. A few years ago, a mysterious and uh, elusive French artist uh, known as Banksy uh, set up a nondescript stand in New York's uh, Central Park. And I shared this at the 1115 service last week, so if you heard it last week, sorry. Um, Just make like it's the first time. Um, uh, He set up his artwork outside of New York Central Park kind of as a social experiment because he wanted to see whether or not people would recognize his priceless works of art if they were sitting on a street corner versus if they were hung up in an art gallery. And so he set up a stand. He hired a random older gentleman to sit at the stand, uh, and he was selling his works of art that were worth up to ten, tens of t- thousands of dollars. One sold at over $20,000, $200,000. Some went for over a million for $60 at a stand in New York Central Park. Would anyone notice, or would they just walk on by? He set up a hidden camera to see what happened. And uh, the video went viral because a lot of people walked on by. After being out on the street the whole day, only eight people bought prints. Um, and it went viral. The news agencies caught it. And I want you to take a look at this very short clip as we come to a close this morning. Check this out. An elusive street artist known as Banksy. His graffiti creations have sold for millions of dollars, if you can find them. But a few lucky people realized he was actually selling his work for, oh, $60 a pop on the streets of New York City. ABC's Lindsay Janis has a story. A French painter once said, art is not what you see, but what you make others see. And that was certainly the case in New York's Central Park, where this stall popped up, selling what appears to be stencil art, knockoffs from the famed British street artist Banksy. Of course, these have to be knockoffs since they're priced at $60. And Banksy's original works go for upwards of $20,000 per stencil. 
Now imagine how much more interested these passerbys would be if they just took time to see that these are indeed original works from the artist himself, signed, one even with his phone number. The sale began at 11.30 a.m., but it wasn't until four hours later they found a buyer, a woman who negotiated half off the $60 price tag. 30 minutes later, a New Zealand woman buys two. And an hour and a half after that, a man who says he needs something for his walls walks off with four more. For the shoppers, impulse buys that promise to reap rewards for a long time to come. In fact, those Banksy works could be worth tens of thousands of dollars. Everyone that bought a Banksy print that day left their email address. And the next day, Banksy himself uh, sent out certificates of authenticity to every single person who bought a print. When the, when the woman who bought two from New Zealand discovered that her works that she bought on the street were actually authentic Ban Banksy's, she immediately put them up on an auction and sold those two prints that she bought for $60 each for over $210,000. $210,000. Now, now, what was the difference? What was the difference between common street art that people walk by? And by the way, you can watch the whole video online on Banksy's website, actually. It's pretty funny because one woman walks by, looks at it, it's like, eh, just kept on walking. They didn't realize the value that was sitting there. Over a million dollars worth of art was sitting there being sold for 60 bucks a piece. A piece. What was the difference? The difference was they found out who the artist was. They found out who the artist was. Once these people, once that woman realized who the artist was, she realized the value of what she possessed. Can I tell you who the artist is who made you? His name is God. He's not just any God. He's the creator of the heavens and the earth. And he made you the way that he made you because he loves you. You're his child. With all your quirks and your personality flaws and even the deficiencies, listen, you're still his child. The one of infinite value. He's the master artist. Therefore, you're not a hot mess, amen? You're a masterpiece. You're not a piece of work. You're a work of art. Because of who made you? One of the Banksy arts, I don't know if you saw it, is like a rat drinking a beer. You know what I'm saying? You'd be like, who wants that? I mean, maybe it might look cool in my house, but whatever. Like, uh, that, you know, sometimes we can look at ourselves and say, what am I? It's a rat drinking beer. I don't have any value. What am I? When you know who the artist is, my God, you're priceless. My God, you're priceless. Don't let what you see in the mirror or what other people say about you define you. Don't let other people who walk by go, nah, it's nothing important. Nah, it's just stupid. Just ugly art, whatever. No, 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 no. The artist that made you is God. And that means you have infinite value. The other thing that we realize from this is that art, the value of art is based on how much someone is willing to pay for it. Isn't that true? I mean, one person bought a Banksy work for over a million dollars. Somebody was willing to pay 200000 for those two that you just saw up there. When we realize how much someone is willing to pay for something, its value goes way up. Isn't that true? Can I tell you what someone paid for you? God paid for you with the blood of his son, Jesus. The blood of his son, Jesus. The one of infinite value paid for your life to be saved and set free and redeemed with the blood of his son who is also of infinite value. What does that say about you? You have infinite value to God. Don't let what other people say about you define your value. Don't let even what we would say about ourselves define our value because God thinks you're pretty darn important. He said, you're my child. I made you and I bought you with my blood. Trust me, walk with me. Believe in me, God would say. And I've got better days yet for you around the corner and the greatest destiny of all in heaven when this life is over. Rahab could have easily said, I'm nothing. I'm worse than a rat drinking beer. I'm a prostitute. I have no value. But she chose to trust in God, and God rewrote her story, gave her a new destiny, gave her a new legacy. The past was gone, and the new has come. God wants to do that for every single one of our lives. Amen. And if you're here today and you're a Christ follower, never forget who you are. Don't let life squeeze you in. Let's be the children of God in this world and represent him well to others around us. Amen. Will you bow your heads with me as we come to a close? Father, we thank you so much for your love. God, we'll never fully understand this side of heaven, how much you love us and you think about us. But you remind us in your word. And you remind us every time we think about the gospel, what Jesus did for us on that cross. He purchased us, paid for us with the precious blood, with his own precious blood. And God, that says to us, 
reminds us every day who we are because of whose we are. Lord, help us to live as children of God, not giving in to the lies and the temptations of life, but rather saying, I'm a child of God, therefore I'm going to love like a child of God. I am a child of God, therefore I'm going to serve like a child of God. I'm going to act like a child of God, treat people like a child of God would, because that's who I am. Lord Jesus, help us never forget who we are in you. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name.